Yep. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So just providing a project update on the on um Share Energy's community heat development unit project. Um yeah, my name is Ben Cannell. I work at Share Energy. This is the main thing that I'm working on. Um and yeah, this is a um energy redress um funded project research project and our project partners are Community Energy England who are helping us with on the community engagement side of things and connecting with um with community energy organizations and then March's Energy Agency who are helping us look at um pricing up various different bits of retrofit work. Um so yeah just a bit of background so the yeah the project or yeah the project was applied for um following I guess as Kate uh, referred to there's been multiple CEF feasibility studies um yeah, I guess these have been driven by communities at locations who want to look into decarbonizing their heat, um, where they've and they've they've looked at heat networks as a as a means of doing this. Um, yeah, not, very few of these projects kind of moved beyond the initial CEF CEF stage one study, um, and generally it seems like it's because the locations where they've been conducted in aren't necessarily that suitable for heat networks, e.g., they're often missing large anchor loads and quite rural settings um so i guess the, the aim of this project is to take a different approach is to identify start off by identifying locations where centralized heat networks could work um approach communities in those locations and try and better understand how to support these communities on an ongoing basis of how to develop and operate operate heat networks um so yeah, so I, I guess the 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 detailed objectives of it are so it's, yeah, it's it's a research project, not a development project. Um the initial initially we're trying to define what a uh what a feasible centralized district heat network looks like. So from an engineering and financial perspective, um using low carbon heat sources. Um yeah, identify locations are in mainland Great Britain where these networks could be deployed and try and work with community organizations at those locations to develop these further. Um, yeah, do some business planning work and legals with how the district heat networks could operate. And then also look into what unit could be set up to support the development of these networks going forward. So I guess that could take different forms like that could, it could be mostly a knowledge sharing basis or maybe there's some kind of shared services which communities would need to be set up to 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 enable them to actually be able to develop these projects and operate them um yeah in practice so yeah it's just a summary of the progress we've completed so we've defined kind of what 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 our centralized district heat network would look like so what what then kind of the um the features are of the network model which we're looking at uh we've developed a techno-economic model of this kind of conceptual network which is designed for doing a site site search so for screening different locations um we then done some mapping work to identify and qual um, quantify the the relative feasibility of those projects at locations across the country and then we've started on doing some of the business planning work, looking at different ownership models, et cetera. Um, yeah, it's mostly like the techno-economic modeling and the site searching, which I'm going to talk about today. That's where most progress has been made to date. So, um, yeah, so what what does the network that we're looking at, um, what features what features are there in, the, in this heat network model, which we're focusing on? So we're looking at, uh the heat source being large air source heat pumps um so i guess we're the main main um uh yeah the mo main things which are important with what we're looking at is we're looking at a model which can be replicated across that country so so we're aiming for less site to site variability um and so i guess if, if we're going to avoid dealing with the ground so looking at share looking at um uh large closed ground loop and um, ground source heat pumps then uh there's an element there's an added element of risk over looking at large air source heat pumps because we're then dealing with the ground it's also less capex but a lower cop a lower seasonal cop for the air source heat pump um 
So uh, I guess our initial stance has been, let's see if we can get large air source heat pumps to work. And then if they can't, then maybe let's move to looking at um, a ground source heat pump model. Um, yeah, then uh, based on research, which we did at the start of the project and also our findings at a project we're working on at Bishop's Castle, um, including uh, renewables into a heat net network project, which is powered by heat pumps, is um, consistently looks like it improves project finances and in many cases seems like it's quite critical for um, a pro heat network project to be feasible, reducing the spark gap essentially. A benefit, I guess, of a centralized heat network is that you can there's there's the possibility of directly connecting the renewables to the heat generating um, units to the heat pumps, um, which is something which is more complicated with other models. Um, we're also we're we're not saying we're going to be one hundred percent low carbon heat source. Uh, yeah, ba based on findings of other people and what we've what we've um, what we've modelled. If you can provide 10% of the heat by hydrocarbon backup, that could lead to a 50% reduction in your heat pump sizing. So aim for 90% of your annual heat demand supplied by the heat pumps, 10% by your backup, which may be like the gas or oil boilers. Um, that can be that, that can be changed in the future to electric boilers potentially. Um yeah, it all depends on how how the electricity prices change. Um yeah, also we're looking at including large thermal storage tanks, which couples well with uh, more variable electricity generation. Um, and then we're focusing on heating domestic buildings enabled by non-domestic anchor loads. So, uh, yeah, we really want to make sure that we're we're directly looking at and focusing on supporting decarbonization of heat in homes um, rather than purely non-domestic heat networks. So, uh, yeah, so we've developed our techno-economic model, which is building in those different kind of engineering concepts um, into, into, a, into a model, which we can then use to assess different sites. Um, we're intending on publishing this on our website. I guess it, it's, a, it's a screening model. It's not, um, it's not a comprehensive fin financial model, which you then submit to like the Green Heat Network Fund, for example. Um, but uh, so yeah, there's a few bits of, I guess, financial trickery which it's not, which is not including. It's essentially set up to be able to um, look at what the relative payback periods are for different um, different site configurations. And so, in terms of inputs, where um, the model set up to accept inputs which would be specific to a site. Um, so we've got heat demand from domestic and non-domestic buildings. So that feeds into what the the balance of the different um the different heating profiles look like um connected buildings feeds into our network length estimation so building density essentially um the amount of renewables generation which we're including be that um wind or ground mounted solar yeah site details of so the the area which the network is covering um the air temperature varies across the country the average annual air temperature and then um, some financial details, such as the loan interest rate um, and also the heat tariff. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess in terms of the in terms of the loans, we're we're assuming the pipe work will be financed over a fifty year period, and then um, everything else is over a twenty five year period. So, like the heat pumps, um, the heat interface units, the renewables. Um, yeah, there's there's going to be more details of this on our website. Um, so, uh, yeah, so yeah, what's included? We've um, so we include hourly profiles of domestic and non-domestic buildings um, of the of the heat demand, um, solar and wind generation profiles, air temperature profiles, which then also allows us to, to calculate hourly cot profiles for the heat pump. Um, yeah, cost estimates for pipe work and trenching, network length estimation, um, costing for the heat pumps and network pumps, uh, connections to buildings, including heat interface units and um, and works to to connect buildings to the network, um, costings for renewables, renewable generators, um, and grid connections, and then also thermal storage. And we also include some some kind of technical modeling of 
the benefits of thermal storage. Um, I'm just going to go through a couple of these in a bit more detail just to give you an uh, idea about some of the, the background work that we've had to do to uh, to get some confidence in what we're doing. Um, so, uh, yeah, in terms of the network length, I guess we, if you're looking at a specific heat network site, then you um, maybe you'd have an idea of which, exactly which buildings are going to be connected into the network. Um, and you could use a tool such as Thermos, which is a network optimization software, um, where you, on a map you can select which buildings you want to connect in. You can say where your energy source is, which roads or, or pathways might be included as potential pipe work runs. And then um, you can set Thermos running and it will estimate what your network layout looks like in your different piping sizes, et cetera. Um, so because we're we're looking at national screening, that's... It's too computationally intensive for us for us to go through doing a thermos run at each location. Also, we don't know which buildings we're going to be connecting in. So we need a means of estimating network length from um from from uh parameters which we can extract from from some mapping mapping data. So so we're looking at using OS data to um estimate building density across the country. And then we've taken 16 thermos runs looking at different building types, all focused or well, mostly focused on domestic building networks. Um, and then, uh, yeah, using these thermos runs, which have estimated what the network length is by estimating what the network route is and comparing that with what the building density is in that network, we've produced this regression, um, which then allows us to estimate network length from building density. So yeah, in this chart, we've got building building density along the x-axis, network length per building on the y-axis, um, and um, yeah, towards the right, I guess we've got less length per building, which is generally in the, uh, networks which have included terraces, and then I guess if you're going towards less dense area, you've got networks which are involved connecting to detached buildings. So um, yeah, the trend I guess, behaves in a way you'd expect. Um, we've also, yeah, as I said, we've included hourly profiles of renewables generation again, cause we're, this is a national screening process. We're not, we don't have renewable generation data or estimates for specific sites. Um, so we've taken aggregated annual generation profiles for wind and solar across the country. Um, I guess the. It seems it's, it's kind of the best we can do for for a screening study. When you've got an aggregated profile, you're going to have you're going to lose some of the the peaks and the troughs. So, um, on one one hand, it's more likely that your generation solar and wind generation profiles are going to match up with your heat demand profile because it's probably more likely there's always some electricity being generated because we're looking at all generation sites across the country. On the on the flip side, thermal storage is probably going to be of less benefit. Because thermal storage helps balance or um yeah, helps smooth out the peaks and troughs essentially of your gen between your generation and your heat demand. Um so if you've got less peaks and troughs, thermal storage is going to be used a bit less than what, what would be in reality at a specific site. Um so yeah, that's the wind and solar profiles which we've included. Um oh yeah, we're saying the wind and solar profiles that are included in the model, they get uh scaled based on what the what the um what the annual uh, uh, annual wind or solar yield is at a specific location, but I'll go into how we how we determine that in a in a future slide. Um, we've also included profiles, um, heat demand profiles. So, uh, this is just an example of a aggregated non-domestic and domestic heat demand profile within the network. Um. We've got yeah a certain amount provided of of heat demand provided by the heat pump and then the backup um, peaking boilers providing like topping up the heat when the when the heat pump um, maximum heat output is reached. Uh, we've used a bit of a software called PyLisa, which has got a lot of different domestic profiles built in to um, to generate kind of an aggregated network domestic demand profile. And then on the non-domestic side, um, uh, we've extracted profile shapes from 
um, from gas usage data of non-domestic buildings and also MPRO, which is a um, another piece of heat network design software. Um, and yeah, similar to the wind and solar profiles, the heat demand profiles get scaled based on what the heat demand is at a specific at a specific lo location across the country. And I'll talk more about how we get values of heat demand in a minute. Okay, so then um, how have we gone from the heat model to the the, net, the heat network techno-economic model, sorry, to the to identifying potential sites? Um, so there's yeah multiple multiple uh, inputs to the to the techno-economic model. There's the demand, number of connections, renewables, yield, um, air temperature, for example. So um, so we've done some wind and solar constraint studies to identify potential locations of wind and solar sites. Um, so in terms of the wind constraints mapping, we've uh, yeah, applied filters on the different land usage types, um, buffer zones around buildings, around roads, um, yeah, details of which we're going to put on our website. Um, then use Global Wind Atlas to determine capacity factors at specific locations and then estimated what the annual yield is um, based on up to a maximum of three turbines at a site. Three, ter three, three, one megawatts, what, sorry, three, one megawatt turbines. Um, three, one megawatt turbines, it was felt that that was around the maximum number of turbines which a community organization would consider installing. Um, open for discussion about that, but... Um, yeah, we need to put some kind of reasonable limit on that. Um, similar process for solar. Um, with yeah, using using energy yields uh, from Global Solar Atlas, um, and again, in a, using different land usage um, input layers. With uh, um, yeah, we filtered out filtered out various areas across the UK. Um, yeah, in England, we are missing data to be able to differentiate between. 3A and 3B land grades. Um, if anyone has any ideas about how we can do that better, then yeah, please let me know. Um, it doesn't seem like there's a good data set for it uh, or one which we have budget to buy. Um, so yeah, and again, we've, we've limited the potential size of the solar array to three megawatts. Um, again, based on feeling as to what a community group the site scale of a project which a community energy organization might take on to develop. Um, so heat demand, so heat demand with uh taken from hot map, the hot maps data set. Um, so this is a data set which uses um like roof size and building occupancy to estimate building volume um, and then also takes into account building age, degree days, etc to estimate what the heat demand is of a building. Um, we did a few comparisons of hot maps data against data and um, heat demand data, which was published in community-led feasibility studies. And the relationship seemed pretty good. Um, so uh, yeah, so for, for national screening purposes, it seems like it's a reasonable data set to be using. Um, We've also uh, included DEC certificate heat demand data for non-domestic buildings, which is useful for picking up um, and identifying anchor loads. So leisure centers, hospitals, schools, et cetera. Um, uh, we've included that heat demand data in our, in our map layers. Um, we've reduced the domestic demand by 50% to represent an, a 50% uptake factor within, a, within an area. And um, we haven't done that for non-domestic because we don't want to reduce the demand of, of a leisure center or a school by 50%. Um, so then, then building density, so number of domestic and non-domestic buildings within in, in a particular area with estimated using OS address base. Um, so the best source of information for that. Um, again, we've uh, reduced the number of domestic connections by 50% to represent 50% uptake factor within an area. 
so then bringing all this all these different inputs together to um to run a site search so firstly we we did a lot of model a lot of runs with our models with various different inputs to understand kind of what the lower bound of heat demand density would be for a heat network to be feasible and also look at what different area sizes um might be feasible um this is and uh as with the site searching we've limited the amount of renewables which could be installed to three one megawatt wind turbines and three megawatts of solar for that um so basically take our heat demand map and filter it down to to hectare squares which meet that minimum heat demand value um then split up the the remaining heat demand squares into and and group them up into areas of different sizes so our model is saying that with the amount of renewables we've got, which we've got installed heat networks which uh cover an area over 30 hectares seems to be much less feasible so we've we've um uh yeah created areas based on those heat demand squares between five and 30 hectares and for each one of these kind of slightly arbitrary areas we've sampled the underlying data set so we've sampled the heat demand sampled the building density we've then also associated each area with a, a renewable site which is within a certain buffer area so we've used a buffer area of three kilometers um to and then associated that up that potential energy yield with that site um and then we then run that through our model and which has then come out with a a payback value for for each one of these sites so yeah created these different areas sampled the input data from our, our map players in those areas, run run that data through our model to essentially get a score. Um, so yeah, we've initially been focusing on targeting the gas price based on what the off-gen price gap is now. Um, so yeah, so the output is that we've got, well, yeah, thousands of potential sites including um at least 40 domestic properties um we're going to be publishing this map on our website along with lots more explanation about how we've got we've got here um so yeah i guess maybe key findings that were very dependent like financial success is very dependent on local wind energy um so very dependent on having um yeah being able to connect wind turbines directly in um and yeah, we're using payback period as a payback period of the initial loan as our, our key rating metric. Um, so yeah, it's just looking at a screenshot of a location around to get in touch with community energy organizations um, at those in those countries. Um, yeah, one thing we're starting to think about also is whether seeing as wind is is so key, um, whether we should be prioritizing um, sites and groups which are close to existing wind turbines. Maybe repowering is is a good route to to look look at going down, or um, maybe there's possibilities for community energy organisations to take on existing wind assets um, in conjunction with a heat network. Okay, so yes, yeah, so the next steps um we're yeah we're beginning contacting the community energy organizations hopefully this week um through community energy england um ultimately yeah ultimately we want to find within the scope of this this phase of the project we want to find uh want to, want to develop kind of um feasibility studies at four of these locations um so yeah working with martin at carbon alternatives um and to then yeah, partly feedback into that model and also seed heat, the development heat network projects at those at those locations and support the communities to develop them further. Um, we're also hoping that we can get feedback from community energy organizations as to what what they would need to develop these projects forward and help shape what the CHDU could be or would need to be. Um, MEA, March's Energy Agency, they are doing some work looking at 
what um, kind of retrofit work would be required in homes to allow the network, a heat network to operate at different operating temperatures. Um, so we want to understand how much how much of retrofit work could be built within into the heat network model. Um, how much heat, how much building retrofit do we expect we would need to, uh, I guess, improve the financial viability of a heat network by operating at lower temperatures, having less losses, less, et cetera. So, um, and then, uh, yeah, we're we're starting to work on developing business plans for the heat networks and the CHDE. Um, asking quite yeah, asking questions like, is it feasible for community organisations to go into a joint venture with local authorities? Are local would local authorities be interested in this? Um, we're uh, getting some support from um lawyers on some of the legal sides cover um in conjunction with the business planning work um yeah we want to talk to desness about implications of zoning now we've got something more specific to discuss with them um and uh yeah we are working with a uh, yeah, web developer to try and get our website up to scratch before we publish it, basically. So, uh, yeah, the website's going to have, um, yeah, the the screening model, the sites to some level of detail, um, and some of the outputs of the wind and solar constraints mapping work. Um, it's also going to have some kind of documentation as to how we've gone about our analysis work and our site selection process. Um, and then we expect to have our business planning documents and some of the information associated with the legals on there as well in the future. Um, so yeah, please get in touch. Um, so yeah, I guess if we're we're contacting groups directly, but if you are an interested group at a potential site when the when the mapping works available, please get in touch. If you've got feedback on any of the modeling behavior or the modeling approach, please also get in touch. And or um, yeah, if you're if you're looking at our at our sitemap and you've got something some specific feedback about locations which you're you've got kind of detailed understanding of then please also get in touch because um yeah that'd be really helpful uh that's yeah that's all i had to talk about today <laughs>